recording in there. Yeah, I like it. It's a little better. All right. Sounds great. All right, so we just started. We just um, we just opened it up. I'm seeing the participants are starting to enter the room right now. Um, so I want to start out by saying welcome to everybody. Thank you so much for our panelists who are here to join us today. Um, my name is Rebecca Abel. I am the Employer Engagement and Career Services Program Manager. Joining me today is also Denise Kingman, who is our Director of Employer Engagement and Career Services. And then uh, we also have on the phone Ian Rourke, who is is our Vice President of Workforce. And I would like to welcome him. Um, he's gonna do some introduction remarks and officially welcome our speakers. So Ian, go ahead. Thank you, Becca. Again, my name is Ian Rourke and I serve as the Vice President of Workforce Development and Strategic Partnerships for Pima Community College. And we are so excited to hear from these business leaders this evening. And we know that our students are going to as well, whether they are participating this evening or listening to the recording. Again, we are celebrating the National Hispanic Serving Institutions Week and Hispanic Heritage Month. And while we are on Zoom, we want to take this moment to acknowledge that from where we are broadcasting or where we are presenting from, all of us are presenting from the traditional homelands of the Pasquayaki tribe and the Tahana Otham people in Southern Arizona and Pima County. And with that, I would like to read the biographies of our esteemed panelists. And so uh, we'll start with Adriana Kong Romero, who is the president of the Bank of America in Tucson. Adriana Kong Romero is the president of the Bank of America in Tucson. As president, she connects businesses, families, and individuals to banking and investment teams that will help them improve their financial lives. She also leads the work to deploy Bank of America's resources across the region to address social and economic concerns and strengthen our community. She's been recognized by Arizona Big Media's AZ business leaders for the past two years in the banking and finance category. And this year, she was recognized by Business Tucson as part of the women leading the region and is one of the most influential women in Arizona honorees. And we would also like as Pima Community College to thank the generosity and leadership of Bank of America as one of the recipients of $1 million for the Bank of America Jobs Initiative. Thank you, Adriana. Thank you for having me. Next, we have Rob Elias. Rob serves as the president and CEO of the Tucson Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Rob Elias is a native son of Tucson and is a graduate of the University of Arizona, where he was a member of the 2000-2001 baseball team and earned a degree in political science. As a student of business and business cultures, Rob has learned from and graduated from the Disney Institute spent time with former Starbucks CEO, Howard Schultz, and continues to study brands such as Apple, Zappos, and Nike. Over the last two decades, Rob has used these lessons to help Tucsonans and Tucson businesses grow responsibly and intentionally. He co-founded Southern Arizona's largest musical festival in, uh, with the Oro Valley Music Festival in 2015, which is really cool by the way, until handing it to iHeartRadio. He also served various Tucson-based organizations in senior leadership capacities since the age of 25. Rob also ran for political office in 2019 and now serves as the president and CEO of the Tucson Hispanic Chamber of Commerce. Great to have you with us, Rob. Next, we have Ray Flores, creator of the Sear Vesas brand. Ray has an extensive food and beverage background that spans more than 20 years. As a graduate of the University of Arizona and growing up in the family's El Charo Cafe, Ray knows a lot about how to create a brand which embraces both community and business and how they can come together for long-term success. As a consummate entrepreneur, he grew El Charo Cafe to five locations, built a partnership with the Basha's family and started a concession group at the University of Arizona and a management company that oversees a stable of successful restaurants. He is a passionate leader who cares about his community as he devotes his extra time to being president of the El Rio Foundation and board member of the Lupus Foundation of Southern Arizona. It's great to have you with us tonight, Ray. And finally, our fourth panelist is Natalie Fernandez Lee. Natalie is president of the Meridian Wealth Management a financial firm that manages over $1.7 billion in client assets. With nearly 25 years in the industry, 
Natalie got her start in the financial arena in the late 90s, working part-time at a local bank while attending school at the University of Arizona and Pima Community College. This exposure in college changed her career path from education to business. Natalie partnered with her father, Ruben Fernandez, in 2007, and together they served the investment and planning needs of many individuals, families, nonprofits, and corporations in the Tucson community and around the country. Their focus is simple, clients come first. She is active in the Tucson community and numerous nonprofit organizations, including the American Heart Association, National Charity League, Integrative Touch for Kids, and many others. Natalie is a Tucson native and enjoys spending time with her husband and five children in her spare time. She's also been committed to her family and her community. Lead by example is a model that she, is a model that she embraces to make an impact on the lives and the community around her. Great to have you with us, Natalie. And with that, I turn it over back to you, Becca, to you and the student uh, panel, uh, panel leaders. Thank you, Ian. Thank you so much. So, um, you know, I'm really excited to get started with some of these questions to our panel. Um, today, I decided to do something a little different, and I invited our student senators to be a part of the discussion. Um, since this entire event is really being put on to inspire our students and share career advice. Uh, so I have on the phone with me Miguel, Andrea, and Sage, who each represent different Pima campuses in elected positions as student senators. Uh, Miguel is going to be asking the first question tonight to our panelists, and he's going to direct this first question to you, Adriana, um, to share a little bit. So go ahead, Miguel, take it away. Hi, Adriana. Uh, how has your culture or heritage played a role in your career journey? Oh, that's a great question. Um, you know, a lot of it that has to do with uh, my own upbringing, uh, family, and, you know, that really also helped to build, you know, work ethic. And I see that my mom and my Nina are on one of the, the attendees. But, you know, that's also just really how, um, you know, throughout my career, it's knowing that I had them there, um, being able to rely on, on them if I needed advice. Uh, so I think, you know, from a culture family perspective, I mean, that's something that I've really relied on and, and uh, enjoyed, you know, throughout my life. I'm very fortunate to have that. Um, the other piece, though, is, is also being true to who I am and uh, my cultures. I'm uh, both Hispanic, but I'm also uh, Chinese. So, you know, it's, it's really how it's come together. It's, um, well, it's really made me to who I am and um, enjoying that and being able to be my true self. That's uh, one of the big pieces as a leader that I've also um, really taken on. Yes. That's awesome. I'd like to open this question up now to the rest of the panel as well to share. Um, so Ray, Rob, or Natalie, um, what about you guys? How has your culture or heritage played a role in your career journey? Well, I'll, I'll follow since I'm unmuted. So I'll, I'll take this one. Um, to follow, and I would I would echo a lot of what Adriana said. But you know, being a native Tucson and having a family that's diverse. I have a uh, my father's Hispanic, my mother is um, not, and we we grew up without those parameters. We didn't focus on those differences. We focused on our family, on what made us unique. We grew up with some very strong family values, hard work ethic. We watched my um, dad work very, very hard to raise six kids and my mom be at home doing all of the behind the scenes work. And watching that as I, as I grew up and then came into the workforce, I didn't wanna pick one or the other. I couldn't be my dad or my mom. So I wanted to do both. I wanted to be a mom and I have five children, but I wanted to be a business leader and I wanted to, to run a successful business and have an impact on our community. So it was um, really taking two pieces. And, and for me, it was joining those two together, which has been a lot of work, but I've had a lot of support to, to be able to do that, fortunately. So um, I, I would say every day I'm reminded of, of what I grew up with that plays a role in and has some impact in what I do each and every day. 
That's awesome. Good for you. That's amazing. Rob or Ray, would you like to share? Yeah, I think the one of the biggest things, and it's probably it's I'm not going to say it as eloquently as Natalie and, and Adriana uh, did, but the the family pastime for the Elias family was uh, was trash talk, and so there was there was always this uh, this argumentative side with uh, my cousins and my brothers, um, and it taught me how to have uh, a quick mind. A sharp tongue sometimes can get me in trouble, um, but also, um, and more importantly, a thick skin, um, and is which really what you need, and has helped me a lot in, in the business um, in the business realm because it's easy to take things personal sometimes, and so when you're in the business in, uh, in the business industry and you're working within the communities, there's things that are not going to go your way, and and how you're going to handle those things. I'm I'm a firm believer that all that trash talk that my cousins still like to give me a, still uh, teach me lessons to, even today. That's great. I'll remember that that's a good thing when my <laughs> daughters are doing that in my house. <laughs> Ray, what about you? How has your culture or heritage uh, kind of played a role in your journey? Well, I'm, I'm Mexican Irish, so I think we drink and fight a lot. Um, <laughs> no, I, I, uh, I um, you know, our culture has uh, been around for a long time in this market in the business sense because our, our business is going on hundred years old, but it's a diverse one. And I think more importantly, what we've always tried to do is tell our story uh, in a way that the next generation or the people that came before us would find that it has quality. So we, we wake up every day thinking about the heritage that came before us, which, you know, it's a mixed one. Um, we have Mexican roots. We also have French roots because our family actually immigrated here uh, in the 1800s to build the first cathedral. That's where, well, that's where most of my family came from was Europe to come and build the first cathedral. And they married into the Mexican family side with being in Arizona, a frontier town to Sonora. Um, that's where our, so our, our mixtures are there, right? And the Charro themselves is a European story, one from Salamanca, Spain. So we have a, we have a mixed bag of tricks, if you will. But I think with that comes this kind of woven fabric that gives us strength and we can, we can point to some of those things and then we often say, well, how can we embrace more cultures into what we do? So we want other people and other types of experiences to come into our play right now. We're in our employment, for instance, we're dealing with a lot of refugee people that we're employing and teaching them our cultures as well as learning from them and how they like to do things. So uh, in a way, I think we're a melting pot into our own little world. And I think that's very American. Yeah, well said, Ray. That's awesome. Thank you for that. Um, our next question, and Rob, we're going to start with you on this question. Um, Andrea has a question for you that she's going to ask. Go ahead, yeah. Andrea. Yeah, thank you. I was just wondering, who do you look up to for mentorship or inspiration? Well, I appreciate the question, Andrea. Um, certainly, my dad was was somebody that I always looked up to. He, he passed away, unfortunately, about seven years ago, um, but the lessons that he taught me still live on and still I still use to this day and, and will pass them on to my to my daughter as well. Um, I think he's been my biggest influence in my life um, as far as a mentor. Um, but there are other people that definitely inspire me, people in, that are in history that have been in business or been in politics. Uh, of course, Abraham Lincoln is a big uh, um, I'm a big fan of his Steve Jobs. Um, my goodness, there's so many walt disney is 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 another one i mean there's just so many people i'm a student of business and and i find inspiration um really from any of those places awesome what about you adriana what do you think well uh as i mentioned earlier uh my my aunt my mom um you know and also my grandmother uh i was uh fortunate to have been raised by very strong women and uh you know we even had a saying you know here's a strong women uh, may we know them maybe we be them maybe we raise them so uh i definitely was fortunate to have that but also i've had some great sponsors and mentors uh throughout my career too that i would not be there here where i am you know if it weren't for them and i think that's something that as students uh that you're getting your going through your journey is really you know trying to find those mentors and sponsors that are going to sponsor you throughout your career or your 
um, journey right now as you're going through school and, um, you know, give you that advice that you might need. So, you know, there's, I've been fortunate, but then also, you know, when the elevator goes up for you, remember to send it down and sponsor someone or mentor someone else. You know, you bring up a really good point, and it's a point that we get from students a lot. We tell them, find a mentor, find somebody that inspires you, learn from them. But can you guys, and this is kind of an off question, but can you guys give the students some tips on how do they find a mentor? How can they find someone that can kind of help groom them and coach them? Um, I think, you know, one, one thing you just said right now is inspiration. So someone that you inspires you, or that you want to learn from. I mean, I think that's also a big component is having that uh, intellectual curiosity and what is it that you want out of that relationship? So understanding not just having someone that you're, you could say is mentoring you, but if you don't know what you want out of that relationship and, and a mentor mentee, you know, that would be kind of difficult. So I would say that's number one is trying to find what it is that you're seeking. Yep, great. Anything that you guys want to add, Natalie or Ray, or even Rob, from my second question there? Um, I would I would just ask that to ask questions. I think people, you know, you just have to ask questions. You have to ask people things. I mean, what do they wake up and do the first thing in the morning? What's a thought about what they what do they go to bed at night with in their head? Like, I, I think people get. I can I can sit here and I can give you a whole list of KPI how we run our company, it can be on a, you know, I can show you a balance sheet and a PL and that can bore you to hell or not. If you're interested in food and beverage, it might, if not. But I think, um, I think what I've learned is that if you can ask people questions about their daily lives, what their beliefs and what they enjoy about what they do, not necessarily the technical side, because nobody really likes to talk about the technical side. If they, if they tell you that they're an analyst and you run away from them. Um, if you really want to talk to entrepreneurs about the, what it takes, a lot of it is in the spirit of the person. And you need to find out if that spirit aligns with your own. Um, ask questions. I, I like to sit down and talk to young people about what we go through, but I don't necessarily like talking about my food cost or my labor cost or how much rent I pay or my, you know, how I index our food purchases or other. Those aren't really that fun to talk about. But I do like how I to talk about how I balance my family life or how I balance what I might enjoy doing in my off time, because it often, I think often you get to know the person a little bit more and then you can decide if they, if what they do, you can see a little bit of it in yourself or challenge to bring something out of yourself that you may not have thought of before. So I would, I'd sit down with a list of questions. Yeah, those are, that's some excellent points you know, learning about what inspires somebody, what um, motivates them, the things that you don't necessarily learn from a book are the things that, um, you know, that students should be kind of looking for and asking questions about. So that's great. Anything that Rob and Natalie want to add to that? You know, I would follow up on, on what Ray is saying with the questions that you're asking. Don't be afraid to ask anyone and everyone those questions. The most successful people in your eyes would be happy to take time out of their day to spend time answering those questions and passing that back down. Um, I, <clears throat> ironically, as you asked this question just this morning, um, I have a very, very hectic and busy schedule. So for me to work out, which is very important to have that balance, I have to wake up in many cases at 3.30 or four o'clock in the morning to do it. And my husband just thinks I'm absolutely insane and tells me that every time. But this morning as I got up, there was someone I had met back in the late 90s when I was working at the bank that that's what he did. And he was very successful. And just this morning, I happened to think, actually, I remember him telling me that he would get up at 3.30 and go swim laps because that was the only time he had to do it. And it, it reminded me of that. But there's things that that... I think any successful business, you know, entrepreneur or, or individual of any, of any point is going to say that they've learned and stolen things from other people and any successful driven person is still learning. Um, I never stop asking questions now because that's the only way I'll continue to, to be better and continue to improve. So whether you're in college right now and, in classes and learning and figuring out what you want to do, or your Ray Flores and and running this 
you know, massive restaurant concepts expanding all over the place, which is incredible, there's still more to learn. We all learn more at every stage. And that, and to me, that's the best growth you'll see over time. Know that it's, it never ends. That's awesome. Rob, anything that you want to add to that? Sure. I'll, I'll add a, a couple of things. The, the one thing that I always thought was, that was important is, is discovering how you define success because sometimes it's not a million dollars in the bank or, um, you know, whatever dollar amount that you make, you know, I, I know people that are millionaires that are, that are unhappy. And I know people that make $40,000 a year and, and they love their life. Uh, and so it just depends on how I, I encourage people to discover what they, how they define success and what that looks like, and then go find people that share those values. And the only way you can, you can find out is just like, like Ray and Natalie and, and Adriana said is ask questions. You have to talk to people and not about, not about the tactics of the business, but what do they value in their life? And that, that's very telling about how a, per, how a person is, how they behave and what they believe in. Yeah. So I guess the one message that I'm hearing from all of this is be curious, never stop learning, never stop asking the questions. Uh, it's how you're going to really experience growth and you're going to learn. So thank you for that, guys. Uh, we're going to pop now to our next question. Um, and I'm going to start this one with you, Ray. So I'm going to direct this one to you. And I want to know, Ray, did you always know that this is what you wanted to do for your career? And if no. yes, how did you know? Go ahead. No, I still don't know what I want to do. Um, I'm, <laughs> I'm in my approaching mid fifties and I still don't really know what I want to do. I'm a, I'm a serial entrepreneur. I'm an AD, I have ADD with all, you know, I, I wasn't a 4.0 student. I barely made it through college. I think the process mattered more to me than the end result. And I'm still learning from it. And, you know, um, I've done a lot of different stuff. I've had companies that were in medical. I've had companies that were in real estate. Um, I've had companies that were just recently, I, I did all the testing for COVID for the city of Tucson. People don't know that because they know the brands of El Charo and they know the brands of Cervase, et cetera. But I mean, I have, a, I have a sense that when I see something and I think there's a solution that I can provide, I usually want to tackle it. But, you know, um, a lot of that, too, it comes back to the community, too. I mean, this is a community effort right here, right? I mean, you guys have the chance to talk to these folks on this phone call. And part of it is because we actually want to see you be successful. We don't know you from Adam, but our jobs as stalwart, stewards of the community or just to be reasonable people in our community even is to help the younger people or the people that want to learn to do better every day, whether they're, whether we know them like they're our own children or whether they're folks just like yourselves. And I can tell you that some of the most successful ventures I've ever had in business have often stemmed from something I did in a community sense for nonprofit or from a social, from a social issue where I might have solved a problem for somewhere. Um, they mentioned that I was the board president of El Rio. I was actually the board president of El Rio, I think, maybe 15 or 20 years ago. So I'm not, that's an old resume thing. I think that might've been out there, but I'm very involved with El Rio still, uh, but I help, actually helped form the El Rio Foundation because they didn't have a foundation. They did this amazing work in public health, but they didn't have an arm to raise money and they didn't have an arm to support their services. So I was the second board member ever on the El Rio board. I actually hired their current board director, Brenda, Brenda Goldsmith. Uh, I hired her away from, the Boys and Girls Club, which again is kind of a business angle because I don't think the people in medicine knew how to hire somebody like that. And I did. So it, you know, I applied what I was good at, which was business and marketing and, and whatnot to help form that board. It's now one of the most successful nonprofit foundations in our community. But why I did it was because it was really important to see the impact that El Rio had in the daily lives of the people that worked for me. I was a small, I was a much smaller business than now. And I, I knew that healthcare was the only way people would come to work is if they were healthy. If they, the only way a mom could come to work is if she knew she had somewhere to take her children for healthcare. And the solutions were not readily available. So we were driving the narrative to say, hey, look, here's a way of helping our, our community. But in, the, in turn, it ended up helping me because it led me to all kinds of things. I mean, you mentioned at the beginning uh, at the narrative was that, you know, we're on possible Yaki land. I ended up 
doing an amazing amount of work with the Paso Yaqui tribe because of my commitment to El Rio as a community group, I ended up running ABBA. I opened the ABBA venue because from an entrepreneur standpoint, I'm like, I can do that. And I really didn't know what I was doing, but I opened ABBA. And then the next thing you know, I'm, I'm booking concerts with 50 Cent and Van Halen and, wow. and, having this, and having this incredible time. But it all started because I was helping the Yaqui population with access to healthcare through El Rio. So, you know, I think part of the, the idea of being an entrepreneur is start with doing good. Mm-hmm. Start with doing something good. And will that and good will lead to great. If you keep doing good, it will just get better. So just start with doing good. Yeah. Don't start off on the foot of trying to cut a corner or to get, get rich quick or to jump ahead of everybody. Start with doing good and the rest will come. And, even, and, if, you get, and if you get slapped backwards, go back to starting good again. Because you will get slapped backwards. That's just going to happen. But take that as lessons. Take that as education and keep redoing yourself. Because, yeah. you know, I've had plenty of restaurants close, but I've had plenty of restaurants work. And that's just the nature of the beast. Yep. Yep. So, um, you know, kind of a follow up question to that, and I'm going to pose this to to all of our panelists on the call. You know, a lot of times students, um, you know, they come and they're not sure what they want to do. They're undecided about their career path. And we also have a lot of students that join us that are thinking about making a career change or doing upskilling um, so that they can get like a better opportunity at some point. So what advice would you guys have for those students who are unsure of their career path, not quite sure what they want to do, and they're looking for some type of direction and anybody can answer this one well i i think you know the students that are attending this panel right now or are going to watch it i think that's a big step uh getting to know the local leaders um i'm pretty sure any leader in the community if you reached out to them just asked them to pick their brain if that's a career you're thinking of i'm sure they would give you some time uh on their calendar just to sit down and talk to you about it. Um, that's really, I think, one of the best ways to explore different career uh, opportunities or just to see, you know, what is it really like? Um, so I, I think the outreach is gonna be a big component. Yep, that's great. Anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I think we just gotta try stuff. You know, I mean, we, we don't know if what we're gonna like until we try it. Um, and, and there's no harm in, in trying something and saying, you know what, that wasn't for me. I, I need to go do something else. Um, and that's perfectly, that's perfectly fine. Don't, don't take that as a failure or you, you tried something and, and you didn't like it. That's, that's a good thing in my opinion. So you should never be afraid to try it, try new things and, and be okay with sucking at it too. That's, that's the, you know, that's a big, um, somebody shared that a bit of advice with me a long time ago is don't be afraid to suck at something. You know, we all, we all had to learn to walk and we weren't very good when we first started, but you got to keep doing it in order to get better at it. Yeah, great. I, I think that there are a lot of times it is very natural for people to hold themselves back and not take that risk, not try. They're afraid, like Rob, you said, of sucking, of failing, of not doing well, of making no money. You've got bills to pay or where it would... What's your time frame? How old are you? What are your expenses? There's all these things that are on our mind. I, I think that the, the people that are on this call would, I, I would assume, um, have been through similar experiences where we've all had really tough times along the way. And it typically came at a point where we took a risk. I can give you a very specific example of a time in in my career, and it wasn't that long ago, it was about 13 or 14 years ago that I, I took a risk to do something and, and it cost me every single thing I had. I had been, I, I thought pretty successful at that point, but that what I did cost me, and when I say everything, I mean every penny that I had. And I had two kids at the time. My kids remember eating peanut butter and jelly sandwiches and bean sopita to make it through uh, some really, really hard times. And I could have easily quit. I, I was really hard, but I never even, it never even entered my mind. I just kept doing what I did every single day over and over and over again. But if, if I think the pressures today is, is that there, there should be a path and a way to do it. And this is how you measure success. I would take all of those things and throw it out of the window and know that your path to get 
to, to what success looks like for you is going to be different than everybody. So take in all that you can. Do not be afraid to fall flat on your face. Don't give it time. Some success comes really quickly and immediately and you feel it, especially financially. Some people get that lucky, gosh, it just happened overnight. But for a, a lot of other people, it's years and years of work and trying and changing and molding and starting over. Um, some of the most sec successful people have started over many, many times uh, to get to where they are. So don't be afraid of that. Don't take shortcuts. Put yourself out there and, and give it a try. If it doesn't work, I promise you there's something else out there that, that you go to next. But don't let that fear of failing stop you from trying because you'll probably fail a time or two to call yourself really successful down the road. That's great advice. So, you know, what I'm hearing is it's okay to not know right now what you want to do in five years and 10 years and 20 years um, and to just take those chances. Um, and you know, if you fail, right, it's okay. You can start over, you can try something new, you can pivot, right? Everything in the last two years has been about pivoting. We're good at it by now. So give it a go, do something that really inspires you. Um, our next question is gonna be for you, Natalie. So don't go off mute just yet. Um, this question is around reading. Um, something that a lot of leaders swear by, right? How many books do you read a month? Can you share with us um, some of the books that you recommend that students should read to kind of inspire them in their career path? So I'm, um, I, I love to read. And one of, someone on here said earlier, look at what ask questions just day to day, what do other successful people do? I remember years and years and years ago, um, list, reading about a study that had gone in and, and kind of surveyed or talked to some of the most successful business people in the world. And, and one of the very common, one of the most common um, things that existed among all of those is that they read and they read a lot. So I, I read a lot um, and with technology advancing, I, I love a good old fashioned book, but with technology advancing, I'm constantly reading even shorter articles. My time span um, and my time frame every day, I might have 20 minutes here or there, or maybe it's three minutes. So I'm always reading little bits and pieces and inspirational items but also the news, the global news, the what's going on around the world, what's going on around the country. I, I look at both perspectives. I read things that aren't necessarily something I would agree with to gain perspective and to understand what someone else may be thinking. My favorite book of all time is called The Greatest Salesperson in the World. And when I was in college, uh, doing a summer job where I sold books door to door around the country, literally knocking door to door to sell books. Um, the best worst job I've ever had. Someone gave me that book and it is like a Bible. And every young person I know, I tell them, read the greatest salesperson in the world. It talks an awful lot about rejection, perseverance, work ethic, and just going and going and going. So that's that's kind of my default favorite book when it comes to business, but read because you're going to learn a lot of different perspectives and a lot about different different things by reading. It's great. What about the rest of you? Anything that you guys recommend for students when it comes to literature to inspire them on that career journey? Yeah, I've read um, Long Walk to Freedom by Nelson Mandela. I think that's a fantastic book. Um, another one of my favorites is The Infinite Game by Simon Sinek. That's, a, that's an incredible book. I mean, Simon Sinek is just a great author anyway. He's written um, Start With Why, Leaders Eat Last. Uh, there's, there's a few others that he's written that are really good. Um, the Ride of a Lifetime who is written by Bob Iger. He's the former CEO and chairman of the Walt Disney Company. Just, just incredible lessons about how to deal with failure and a lot of things Natalie spoke about as well. Awesome. Adriana or Ray, anything you guys wanna add? Um, I don't mind going, you know, I, I'm probably gonna burst some bubbles here. I don't read all that much anymore. 
Um, when I was younger, I read a lot. And um, what I find myself right now, I think we have, I think we're, I think we're in a fortunate position where you have access to things we didn't have access to. I mean, I'm sure Natalie can tell you that because I know her, her husband and I think we're all in the same age bracket, but our, our computers were big enough to, you know, you could drop them and crush a house. So, you know, I used to have paper where we'd have to put them on those little scrollers that were like dot matrix printers and, um, you know, there was no internet. And so it, the technology you have before you can be used abusively, but it also such a wonderful thing. I think these TED talks that are out now are phenomenal. You can actually hear from people having to, like us, be put on the spot to answer these questions. And it gives you, it gives you a kind of look into their soul because you can actually see their face and their gestures when they're speaking about what they've done or what they do. I will say that I, I, I read enough and a lot when I was younger. And one of the books that I liked, and I still refer to it, was a book called Good to Great. And I drive that book a lot in today's languages with my team because it, it's easy for our, our team to get complacent and say, oh, well, what makes us special? Well, we've been around for 100 years. Well, who cares? I mean, really, I mean, so we've been around for 100 years. That's nice. It, it's, I guess it's different than being around for 10 years. But if, you've, if you're around for 100 years and you're just resting on your laurels or you're not competing, what does it matter? So I don't really get allow our team to get complacent because we've been around for 100 years. I want to know when I see something I just went through today, for instance, when they put something down in front of me and it's going to be put on our menus, which are our Bibles, which are our sales tools. If it's not good enough, then I don't I won't allow it. And it's got to be as great as it possibly can be. Now, I mean, that's relative, right? You can have a you can have a great looking office, but it might cost you a lot of money. But so you want to have a great something in your mind, you have to start to develop what is taking me from being good to being great. And I think good to great from a book standpoint is one of the best studies and best ways to um, show how what makes a company like what's this drugstore versus that drugstore? Why is that one good? And why is this one great? And it could be very simple management practices. It could be understanding. Uh, they use an analogy about seats on a bus and putting the right people on the right seats. And that can happen in any organization. It can happen quickly. I mean, you could see it on, in sports all the time, right? I mean, you, why is this team win and this other team doesn't? And it could just very be simply, they've got the wrong people on that bus in the wrong seat. So read good to great. That's the one I would pick. Awesome. Adriana, any books that you would recommend for students to read? Yeah, um, there's one and it's really simple, easy read, but uh, it's called Who Moved My Cheese? Oh, yeah. And, you know, that one is great because life is going to be happen and, you know, there'll, there'll be things that'll come in and just totally your cheese will be moved. So it's how we react to it, your resiliency, that's going to make a difference. Um, but lately, I, you know, during I, I that's one of the things, you know, during um, 2020 that I really looked at as we were starting to start opening up again, things are coming back to normal as a start, stop and continue that I did, you know, within my own life. And reading was one that I had kind of gotten away from, just it was busy. And so that's something I, I've uh, purposely gone back to um, and made time for because I enjoy it. And so one that I read, um, uh, reread was uh, Brene Brown's Dare to Lead. Mm. And, um, you know, I, I think a lot of times you think that you have to be told you're a leader or leaders, you know, eventually when you get somewhere at some point in your life, you'll be a leader, but we can all be leaders at any points in our lives. We don't have to be uh, told that we're leaders and it could be simple things like helping in the community or, you know, at school, at work, at home. But I think that's really what, um, you know, resonated and, and just a great reminder that it's what we do and the impact that it makes. That's great. I'm writing all of these recommendations down because I'm going to share these out after this and create a little folder for resources that are recommended for students. So thank you guys for sharing those. Um, Adriana, don't go off mute just yet because I'm going to start with you for this next question. Um, and the question is, did you face any challenges on your way to your career success because of, because of your ethnicity? Um, I wouldn't say not as much, you know, because of my ethnicity. Um, you know, I, I it, it was funny because when growing, you know, going, uh, I started off at Midvale and uh, Branch, and uh, my maiden name is Kong, and a lot of times it was the Hispanic Mexican customers that would come up to me and ask me, you know, ¿te casas con un chino? And or did you marry a Chinese? And 
I'd be like, no, you know, that's my, my maiden name. And it's like, all of a sudden it was okay. And so, uh, you know, it just kind of like made me realize like, why is this different or recognizing that, but how do you uh, deal with it? So I, I don't think that there were uh, challenges per se, but it did help me to recognize, be more aware and also get to know other ethnicities within our company and uh, just celebrate the diversity. I love that. Celebrate diversity. Rob, what about you? Well, I, um, as you can tell, I don't look very Hispanic. Uh, you know, my, my, I was not, uh, I don't, I don't have dark skin. I have light colored eyes, but my, my dad, who was 100% Hispanic was lighter complected than me and had green eyes. Um, but I actually had a little different, similar or a little different uh, situation happen to me when I ran for office a couple of years ago. I ran for city council in a predominantly Hispanic um, area of town. And so as I was going around meeting with different people and, and going to different uh, community events, um, I was told probably a dozen or more times that I'm not Hispanic enough to, to, to win. And so it wasn't, I, it wasn't um, used against me of, that I was Hispanic. Um, it was used against me that I wasn't Hispanic enough. Um, and so my entire life, my, my mom is white and, and my dad is Hispanic. So I've never been, I've never been Mexican enough for my, for my Hispanic family, but I'm too Hispanic for my white family. So uh, I've always kind of been in this, in this in between. I don't think it's, it's ever really hurt me. Um, that's certainly not why I, I lost my, my political campaign at all. Um, and I'm kind of grateful now that I did lose. <laughs> but yeah, that's, that's probably the only story that I have about that. Okay, awesome. Ray or Natalie, anything you guys want to add? Have you ever encountered any barriers because of your ethnicity? I'll tell you, I, I have not. I've had similar um, stories, Rob, that you've shared where, you know, I, I heard that same thing. Adriana, I've had some, when I, when I got married and I have Lee on the end, I get asked a lot of times if I'm some type of Asian, you know, background because of that. And my husband is Scottish and Irish. And so I'm not, but it is funny that people, I, I, I am one that shrugs that type of stuff, stuff off like a grain of salt. It doesn't bother me. And if anyone said anything, I, I typically continue moving on my way. I don't have time to deal with that type of stuff. And, and I have had things, of course, um, stated. I'll, I'll give you just kind of a recent, we, we have someone working with us that um, is Caucasian, makes no difference. He's a friend of mine for forever and um, for a very long time. But when he had told some friends of his that he was working here at, at my company, he said, oh, it, the comment someone in the community made to him was how nice it was for him to come in and help this Hispanic woman um, figure out how to run a business. And we just laughed and laughed and laughed because he said, no, you have no idea. She's teaching me how to run a business. This is the complete opposite way around. But I, I think in business and, and culture, I know there's a, we're in a, in a time right now where there's a lot of awareness and sensitivity my, I think my best advice is keep focused on what you're doing, on what's important to you, because there will be a distraction every day if you look for one, or you can not look for one and focus on what's important to you in your life. I have plenty of opportunities where I could have said these things affected me and gotten very caught up in it. I never have. So at this point, I I, it doesn't resonate. I don't think about it. I just go and go and go and go. I have way too many other things to do every day than worry about what someone else might say or judge or, or how, they, how they treat. So um, to me, that's a weight and a barrier that I don't, I don't I've chosen not to, to deal with that and continue to focus on moving forward. That's great. 
Awesome. Thank you guys for sharing that. Um, so our next question, and I'm going to pose this to all four of you, because all of you are involved um, in hiring and building your businesses, right, with talent. So what are some of the most important things that you look for um, when you're going to be hiring somebody, specifically somebody that might be in, um, you know, a, a role just coming out of school or um, someone who's looking to gain experience? What are the most important traits you look for? I'll, I'll jump in. Um, sure. That intellectual curiosity. Um, that is just something that, you know, when they come excited or they're wanting to learn, it's like I feed off of that. Um, you know, so that's that's something I, I look for. Uh, the work ethic, too. Um, that That's something that in our business, you know, it's very important. Um, ensuring that uh, we're taking care of customers, community, you know, and, and what their worth ethic is, you know, that's also something that I, so a quality that I look for in, in candidates. Awesome. Ray, Rob, or Natalie, anything you guys want to add to that? Yeah, well, one of the things that I always look for, um, really one of the main things I look for is culture compatibility. And I know we're talking, uh, you know, we're, you're having us on because of the culture of Hispanic heritage, but I'm talking about from an organizational culture um, do you share values with who we are as, a, as an organization? Um, we don't, we don't select people that can do the job that we need them to do. I'd rather select somebody that believes in what we believe, and then we can teach you how to do the, uh, we can teach you how to do what we need you to do. Yeah, great. I, um, <clears throat> I probably hire a much different type of, or actually I probably have a much different type of hiring processors system or need than probably everybody on this call um that doesn't make me special by any means what it may, what i mean by that is you know we'll open a restaurant and we might hire 150 people knowing that we'll end up with 40 um and that's because in our business there's different there's so many levels of employment and and type of person that fits um you know there are people who simply want somewhere to go to work each day. Um, in a very basic sense, they don't, they're not there in life or in skill to comprehend a level beyond, let's say a dishwash or cleaning position. Um, for instance, right now we have several refugees that have come into our life recently and they're amazing people. And these were people that, you know, were without any roof or food and water for a long time in their life. So what giving them that opportunity in and of itself is a gift to them because they, they don't understand a lot of other things and they could never at right now, anyway, they'd be far away from being able to wait on you, for instance, at us as a bartender or busser or a server rather. And they're definitely not in, in preparedness to be a manager. And so like a lot of people that Natalie might hire are people that have an understanding of the financial market or some kind of understanding of finance um, my managers may have that, but most of my frontline or my back house people don't have that. So I hire kind of like, I hire the world. And a, a lot of times we talk about it in our business, we're managing the unmanageable as well, because a lot of people we also hire may not be folks that are easy to manage. We have a lot of people who are second, third chancers, people that may even have addictive issues or other troublesome paths. Um, mm -hmm. and so we're kind of managing like mini worlds, if you will. Each store almost kind of has its own sort of world. It's not a culture necessarily like Rob talks about because there's a pervading culture that goes on from Flores concepts, if you will. But each store has its own little community. It's almost like its own little biosphere. Um, and how that works may not be completely dictated by what I decide or how I think I can hire. Sometimes it's built on a feeling that the manager has specific to that store when he or she meets somebody that thinks they can fit in. So most of these jobs are not where you folks are headed. You're in, you're in higher education, you're going for another role in life, but you may have fit into that at one point in life. And more importantly, if you haven't done it yet, I highly recommend you working in a restaurant for at least a semester because nothing will teach you about the need to accommodate the human being in life, like it will be working in the hospitality industry. Because I could be walking through a room and whether I'm the president of the company or not, I'm busting a table 
I've washed many a dish. I washed dishes as late as as recent as a year ago, even though because it was COVID in my airport location because dishwasher didn't show up and I spent an entire shift washing dishes. Nothing will teach you humility and how to serve and give you thick skin like working in the hospitality trade. So if you haven't done it yet, consider it a life lesson and go get a job in a restaurant for a few months. It will help you out, I promise. And it turns out we know somebody that might be hiring. So <laughs> Flores well, Concepts I'm, well, might be your thing. place. I'm, I'm always hiring. We're never not, we're Perfect. always hiring. Perfect. Always hiring. We have a spot right for any students that need yeah, that experience. Always hiring. And let me tell you, my servers make more money than me. So it's not a bad gift. That's a, there you go, Ray. We might have to talk offline. Yeah. Um, I have two more questions and we only have about nine minutes left. So I want to try and get to these two last questions. They're coming from our student senators. Um, so I'm going to pop over now to Andrea. Andrea, are you ready to ask your student question of the panel? Yeah, thank you, Rebecca. Uh, so I was just wondering what is one decision you've made that made uh, one of the biggest decisions you've made in uh, regards to your career? And anyone can answer this one. Anybody that wants to jump in. Oh, I'll, I'll go ahead and, and answer. I think the biggest decision kind of, um, and I, I still continue to make this decision um, every day, is I don't let the opinion, the opinions or perspectives of others dictate how I live my life. Um, and that's, uh, nor do I let social media do that or societal norms do that. Um, I live my life based on a set of values that I was taught. Um, um, as a, as a kid uh, by my parents and I, and those still hold true today. I feel like that statement, Rob, should be like, um, like a motto that we put up above our desk. <laughs> Everybody should live by that. Natalie, it, what do you think? Me well. Yeah. What about you, Natalie? What's one of the biggest decisions you've made that has impacted your career? I think one of the biggest decisions I've made, and I've made it multiple times is to take risks and to be prepared to fail and know that if I failed, I know I'm darn good at what I do. I know I can go down and I, I've, I've, Ray, you'll be proud of me. I've done fast food. That was my first job. I've done waitressing. I've spilled beers all over people on accident. I've done every horror thing you can do. Um, but I've always, in, and in raising my kids, I have three kids in college, three college kids right now and two in elementary school. But I tell my college kids, go take risks, try everything, figure out what you love to do. And if that doesn't work, you're, you're good. You're, you're able to go do something else. So don't be afraid to take those risks. You'll never know what your potential is if you don't try it. But if you fail, then you're going to go do something else. If you're the type of person that can take that risk, I promise you, there's a place for you. It just might take a couple of times to figure out what that is. And it, and it may be decades down the road. Um, take the risks and give yourself time to develop because we all weren't who we are today when we were 18, 19, 20, 25 years old. We, it all, it took time to get there and a lot of bumps in the road. Awesome. Adriana, anything you want to add to that? I think, I mean, everything that Natalie had said is, is spot on. Um, and, and it's really, if, if life throws you a curveball, it's that resiliency and making that pivot. What are you going to do uh, differently? And um, it's okay to make those changes. I know you mentioned that you have uh, some students there that are uh, making career changes. And so it's finding that joy in your life. And if you're not happy in what you're doing, then pivot and find something that does. Awesome. That's great. So our last question, and this question, um, Natalie, I'm going to let you start. And then I'd like everybody to just kind of leave us with just some closing remarks here um, is, and or actually Miguel's going to ask this question. Sorry, Miguel, I almost took your thunder away from you. Miguel has a question for you guys that you guys can all answer. Go ahead. Uh, for, apart from what has been said uh, so far, what are some of the advices that you have for us uh, future generations of Hispanic leaders? So my best advice is pave your own path. 
uh, learn from those around you, build off of, of the foundation you've been given. There's probably some of you listening to this that you're, well, everybody on this call or that's going to listen to this has a different foundation. So lay, continue to build off of that, lay a strong foundation for yourself, take a path and, and be confident in those choices that you make. You're going to hit bumps along the road. Your path doesn't need to be the same as the next. Whatever you choose to do, be the absolute best at whatever that is. It doesn't matter what it is, just be the best. Whatever, in, in whatever career path you choose. And if you're working towards that, I promise you, you're gonna find success. Surround yourself around people that, that are successful, that bring you up, not bring you down and learn as much as you can from everybody around you. I'd like to go back and, and, and just comment because Natalie said we weren't, ourselves when we were 18 or 25, et cetera. I can definitely tell you, Miguel, by your hairline compared to mine, I really do wish I was back in, in that age group because God bless you, man. Enjoy that hair while you have it. Um, so, you know, the, I, the, I would tell you that, again, everything we say kind of counts, but be ready to adapt. Um, I, I, put a, I have a hat that I actually wear that has the word adapt on it when we open restaurants because the first thing that people come to me when we open a restaurant is like, I don't know how to do this or where this at because where I'm used to it at is over here or, or, or in our other store, it's used to, you know, we have this over here and I'm like, yeah, but if we put it over here, you can adapt to that. Right. And invariably we have to teach people new work patterns all the time because we're not building cookie cutter stuff. And that's not life. Life, life an enjoyable life is not a cookie cutter life. And maybe it is for some, but definitely not for me. And if you're Latino or Hispanic, probably not for you either. I'm going to say that right now. So I think at the end of the day, be ready to adapt. Be ready that, you know, if your plans don't go ready, do you have a plan B? Do you have a plan C? It may be the better plan. So don't get complacent in thinking that you're on the path. Be ready to change and be ready to adapt because it could happen for any reason. It happened to every one of us no more than 18 months ago when this pandemic started. And pretty soon, for instance, in our businesses, we were pivoting to and having to adapt to just take out business or putting margaritas in pouches or dealing with, you know, the fact that we couldn't cook certain things at the same price or do the same thing anymore. And it does, it comes from an, an attitude that like, I'm okay having to adapt. If you think you're set and you go to bed at night, everything's good. I'm the, the way it should be. As long as I wake up tomorrow and it's the same way it was today, I'll be fine. You'd better off going to bed going tomorrow. I mean, need to adapt. And that's a good thing and be ready for that because you will need to adapt throughout your life. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would also add, you know, staying true to yourself and your, your goals throughout your career journey, and don't lose sight of the important things in your life uh, that bring you joy. And uh, lastly, I would say it's something I said earlier, uh, when the elevator goes up for you, don't forget to send it back down. So, you know, 20 years from now, I hope to see all of you on a panel and, you know, be that leader, you know, for other uh, students, others that are coming up in, in life, you know, as, as a, um, you know, pave the way and uh, be those mentors that uh, they'll be looking for in years to come. Thank you. And Rob? Yeah, um, fantastic advice from, from everybody. And it was truly a pleasure to be on here with you. Thank you so much for providing us the platform uh, to, to be on here. Um, the things that I would say is be obsessively intentional with the decisions that you make, the things that are within your control. Be intentional about those, about those things. Be authentic to who you are and to what you value. It's another thing that I would say. Um, I, I said it before, and I'll say it again, don't be afraid to fail. Um, and when you do fail, because you're going to embrace that feeling and learn from it. And the last thing that I would leave with, that I will leave you with is, is please care for others. That's awesome. What I'm hearing is don't be afraid to pivot. Don't be afraid to take risks. Failure is okay. 
be curious, be authentic to yourself. I've actually written all of these things down so that we can start using some of these when we talk to the students. Uh, but this was really incredible advice. Really quickly, I know we're at time. I wanna pop over to Sage. Sage has been really active over in the chat. Um, and I wanna see you know, if there's any questions that she wants to ask of the panel, um, even though we're trying to be mindful of the time. Sage, go ahead. Yeah, absolutely. So we've had a lot of really good questions come in. Um, there is one from Yolanda Hernandez who says, I'm a Hispanic student with a business idea. Where and how can I start in the US? So if you guys would just give a little bit of insight to that student, um, if you could really quickly so we can answer her question. I started with an NDA. <laughs> um, I mean, if you don't know what that is, I mean, if you've got an idea, that you think is gold and you write it down before you share it, protect it as much as you can. Um, that may be a little advanced for this phone call, I'm not sure, but not too many people understand, but there's actually 380 plus El Charos in America. Um, I only own five of them. And while we're the oldest, back in the 20s and 30s and 40s and 50s, no one gave our great Thea Monica, I wasn't alive, the advice to trademark and protect her name. Um, so if you're out there starting something, you've got some ideas, make sure that whoever you talk to, you can trust that won't take it from you. That's happened a lot when it comes to intellectual property, especially younger and newer intellectual property. And, you know, you can find a simple NDA on Google to have that done. But I would start with people that you trust. Um, start with your, your teachers. I tell my children, and they're young, um, don't be afraid to walk up to your teacher and ask a question and ask them for time, a moment of their time. Don't interrupt what they're doing. Don't expect that they have all the time in the world for you, but make an appointment with them and ask them questions. I'm sure they would like to talk to you as well. And because these panels exist, all of us probably would as well. But I would definitely suggest that whatever you do, if you have an idea, protect it as much as you can. That's great advice. Um, we do have a handful of other questions that came in. Um, Sage has been getting them both anonymously and also in chat. Um, so I would like to ask the panel to be, because we're being mindful of time, if we could follow up with all of you via email to get some answers to some of the additional student questions and then give them back to the students, if that would be okay. Okay, awesome, great. Um, so I wanna thank all of our panelists for being here. Um, the insight and the knowledge that you guys shared has been so wonderful and inspirational to students. I've been watching um, on the side messages come in to my phone saying, wow, I didn't realize that this was going to be a tearjerker. I didn't bring Kleenex with me. I feel so inspired. So thank you guys so much for sharing all of this. Um, I also want to thank Denise Kingman and Ian Rourke from Pima Community College for helping us and our wonderful student senators for helping um, put this event on tonight. Denise and Ian, do you guys have anything that you'd like to add before we close? I just want to recognize, I believe that we were, and I don't know if they're still on, um, we were joined by two of our uh, board of trustees members and just wanted to recognize uh, Maria Garcia, um, as and who was our second one, Denise? Uh, Catherine Ripley was on. Cat, and, and Catherine Ripley, so thank you very much for joining us. Thank you. And I just want to thank everyone for joining us tonight, the panelists. It was very inspiring. You gave some great information. I've been quoting you on Twitter, and uh, we love this. Thank you for coming out and sharing your advice with our students, with our community, and for honoring Hispanic Heritage Month and Hispanic Serving Institutions Week. We really enjoyed this and we love it. And we're gonna post it like we said on our YouTube channel. So thank you for giving back to us. Yeah, thank you so much, everybody. With that, have a great night. Um, we'll be thank in contact you, with everybody again soon. Thank Bye. You. Thank, thank you. you. Stay safe.